Hi everyone, Drew Prode here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. Today we're talking with author and journalist Marta Zaraska on the topic of friendship, optimism, and kindness. If you listen to this podcast, you know I'm all about that life. I believe in those things that are traditionally seen as soft interventions as core things that help us live healthier and longer. And now there's some research to back it up. Marta's book is called Growing Young, How Friendships, Optimism, and Kindness Can Help You Live to 100. And I'll add in maybe even beyond. It's a fascinating interview. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. I'm your host, Drew Pruitt, and each week, my team and I bring on a new guest who we think can help you improve your brain health, feel better, and live more. This week's guest is Marta Zaraska. Marta Zaraska is a Canadian Polish science journalist. She's written for a ton of outlets, including the Washington Post, Scientific America, New Scientist, The Atlantic, amongst others. To start off our interview, I asked Marta how she thinks we ended up in a situation where so many people are feeling lonely even prior to the pandemic, and why softer interventions like kindness and optimism have been forgotten about. I mean, we have certainly forgotten, that's that's for sure. You know, when you think about it, in one survey I read recently, 25% of Americans said that they don't have even a single friend in whom they can confide. You know, a quarter of Americans, not a single friend. That's that's really worrisome. That's not the way things should be. Uh, so we are definitely not in a good place. You're you are right about that. And um, I think it's just have been has been deteriorating, you could say, for a very long time uh, from our evolutionary past when our you know ancestors were always surrounded with their tribe. And this is how we evolved, right? This is why this is why those social relations are so extremely important to our physical well-being because we evolved as a social ape, just like chimpanzees, for instance. And our bodies function the best when we are in close contact with our tribe, because when we are outside of the tribe, right, when you are alone on, your, on the savanna, uh, a lot of bad things can happen to you. You can get wounded, you can get you know, killed or also wounded by some wild animals. And uh, so our bodies have a lot of uh, mechanisms that function differently, whether we are with our tribe, or whether we are alone outside potential with potential lots of dangers to face. And, uh, you know, since we developed agriculture, things started changing. And of course, you know, the speed of change, is, change has accelerated recently. And now we are, many of us are living completely on our own in our one person households and working long hours and commuting by cars. And this is definitely something our bodies were not evolved for. And this is why a lot of the chronic stress that we experience these days, which is not something that we were experiencing uh, in our ancestral past, because then the types of stresses were usually much more uh, acute, much more sudden, and sh- but short-lived. This is something our bodies cannot handle. Uh, so then you see all the side effects, you know, on our diabetes risks, on the cardiovascular disease, cancer. These are all things that relate that are related to the way we live our lives socially. I want to talk a little bit about loneliness, and I think that this year, especially, a lot of people that didn't know that they were lonely even prior to the pandemic because they feel like, okay, there's people around me. You know, that's one of the biggest misconceptions about loneliness that we see. And we've had past podcast guests talk about it. Just because you're surrounded by a lot of people doesn't mean that you can't feel lonely, right? You can absolutely feel lonely. And this year, I think a lot of people have woken up and felt it for the first time because maybe they didn't have that stimulation around them of constantly seeing people at work or other places. What did you learn about loneliness that is helpful in the context of the current state of the world that we're in? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're absolutely right. Actually, in science, uh, uh, scientists tend to distinguish two different concepts. One of them is social integration, and this is how many people 
there actually are for you. So how many people are in your network? You know, how many people can help you in need? How many people, I don't know, bring you soup if you're sick? Stuff like that. So social integration. And the other thing is loneliness. And this is purely, uh, you know, personal. So your feelings, basically. And you can be very well socially integrated. So you can actually have a lot of friends, but still feel lonely. Or you can not feel lonely, even though you have no people around you. So these are not very usually, you know, people who don't have people around them feel lonely, but it's not necessarily the same thing. And science generally shows that both of those things independently are related to health. So both social integration, so the factual, whether you do have people around you or not, and how you feel about it, so the feelings of loneliness are also independently related to health. And the effects are cumulative. So if you have no friends and you also feel lonely, this is the worst case scenario. Um, And, you know, when you think about it, loneliness is one of the worst things that can happen to our health. Uh, Lonely people, in general, they die two and a half to three times um, more, are more likely to die prematurely than people who are not lonely. You know, they have shorter telomeres, so those protective caps at the end of of chromosomes that uh, take important part part in the aging process. Uh, They have uh, higher blood pressure. They have different gene expression when it comes to antiviral protection, for instance, or or cancer progression. So there are lots of things that happen in your body when you're lonely. And when you think, you know, how much more lonely we got in 2020, this is definitely something to to be seriously concerned about. I've even read today a paper exactly written on this topic, you know, to to pay attention to the health effects of loneliness uh, during the uh, COVID pandemic. So when the scientists uh, who wrote that was exactly calling for governments to to pay attention. You know, you shared on Twitter, I believe it was uh, um, recently, about how so many people, I believe it was a survey that you linked to, how so many individuals don't know their neighbor and how Mm -hmm. troubling it is. I believe that you linked out to uh, an article, if that uh, sounds familiar. Yes, Um, (laughs) I don't remember. I don't remember the exact numbers, but they were absolutely terrifying. I know another survey that said that only a quarter of Americans know the name of their next door neighbor, just next door, uh, which is, you know, that's a really, really low number. So 75% don't know their next door neighbor. Uh, and I think that they, in that particular study they sent to Twitter, they were, especially the youngest generations were doing the worst. And it, it's really, really troubling. You know, if you don't even know your next door neighbors and obviously your general integration in the community is probably not the best. And there is research showing that even that matters for your health. So actually knowing neighbors, there were, there was some study done in the Netherlands where they calculated, you know, each neighbor was like lowering your mortality risk by 2% or something like that. So uh, that was obviously extremely precise. But uh, but in general, that's the idea that the more integrated you are, if you do know your neighbors, uh, then your body functions the best. And this is this again goes back to those ancestral times because our neighbors are our tribe as well. You know, if you can count on them coming in, if you have some emergency, this makes you feel safer. This 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 works on your stress axis, like the HPA axis, for example, that, uh, that uh, regulates how we respond to stress and has all these downstream effects on through our hormones, such as cortisol, uh, on our risk of cancer, diabetes, and, and so on. And so this is extremely all important. Mm, absolutely. I want to switch gears for a second here. There's a whole part of the book that is about the importance of romantic relationships, specifically committed relationships. Can you go into that? Yeah. So if there is one thing that's particularly important for your health, when within this domain of social integration, this is the romantic relationship. And when you think about it, studies show that happy romantic relationship usually that's marriage in in research but it doesn't have to be exactly marriage just you know a committed relationship uh can lower your mortality risk by about 49 percent and this is huge because when you look at other studies for exercise or for diet this is usually somewhere between 20 and 30 percent for example the famous mediterranean diet that's 21 percent there for marriage you had 49 percent so you can really see what a huge impact it can have on your mortality risk and you know people who are who live with 
another with their partner, they actually uh, synchronize their bodies to an amazing degree. Uh, they, for example, synchronize temperature regulation, they, uh, their blood pressure, they, their pulse, their heart rate, even electrical activity in their chests. Uh, so there is a lot of things happening to your body when you share your life with another person. And if that relationship is of high quality, then you're really, it's really important, good for your health. Although for men, actually, that's the weird part in research, that for men, even the not very good quality marriage is good for their health. Yeah. And you've talked about how maybe one part of this is the sort of being in a relationship and your partner nagging you or nudging <laughs> you to adopt healthier behaviors. Can you chat about that? Yes, that's definitely part of that. So which women are more prone to the nagging, I guess. Uh, so and actually, there is actual research on that when scientists show the, the part of the effect of a good marriage for men, especially is the nagging effect. So the women reminding them, you know, eat healthy, exercise, meet friends, uh, take your meds, go to the doctor kind of thing. But that's not everything. Another part why, especially for men, a marriage can is important, even a poor one, is because women tend to be the organizers of the social life. Uh, it's just the way it is. And, uh, and that's what comes out in research, that women tend to be more uh, into organizing friendships, having making sure people come over or knowing neighbors. And men profit from this kind of social integration, even if the marriage itself is not very good. Uh, but of course, the, there is, it's, but this, is, this doesn't explain uh, even the social integration or the nagging effect it doesn't explain the whole effects of marriage. There is, even when scientists control for every possible confounding factor, uh, still a lot of the effect of just the relationship itself remains. And it probably has to do a lot with what I talked before, the synchronization that happens, but also the particularly calming effect on our stress response of having someone uh, living with you to whom you are committed for better or for worse. And this, this is actually why the word committed here is so extremely important. You know, relationships are a big theme throughout the book. And as we just covered, marriage is one of those stronger ones or like a committed relationship that's there and how impactful it is. And there's also examples of, of community and friendship. Um, I've talked about this a little bit in some past podcasts, but since our audience has grown a lot, they may not have heard the story. Can you tell us the story of the small town in central Pennsylvania, the uh, town of Rosetto? Yes. So Rosetto is actually a very fascinating town. So yeah, I even considered calling my book, instead of calling it Growing Young, I was thinking of calling it the Rosetto Effect. And the reason for that is that this is a very good example of what growing young is actually about, of how all this social integration and living together can impact health. So Rosetto is a town, it still exists in Pennsylvania, uh, that was settled by uh, immigrants from Italy. Um, and um, even though they didn't bring their diet with them because they stopped eating their healthy Italian foods very fast. They switched to a very greasy diet of sausages, and it was really loaded with fat. But what they did bring with them was their cultural and the way they lived in a community. Uh, so what, uh, what the, this town was very famous for... Um, I mean, maybe it wasn't famous for that, but we'll, let me backtrack a little bit. So why it became famous? So in about in the 60s, uh, scientists noticed that in the town of Rosetto, people were not dying of heart attacks. Basically, nobody had heart attacks there. And in general, the mortality rates there were about 30 to 35% lower than in all the surrounding areas. So people lived longer, healthier. They had no cardiovascular disease. Something was really weird. So when they started studying the, the town, they very soon saw the horrible diet. They, they, they discovered that people, you know, they were drinking, they were smoking. There was also nothing in their genes that made them anything, any particular. Uh, they also used the same water source. They used the same uh, health care as all the surrounding people in the surrounding areas. And yet they were very much different. And what was different was exactly this culture, the Italian style of living together in the community and uh, hanging around with neighbors all the time, having big parties where everybody came together, uh, caring for the community. So people were very proud to make 
to make their town pretty. They were uh, putting flowers everywhere. They were participating in civic organizations. I think they had 22 civic organizations in a town of 2,000 people, which is amazing. Uh, and um, and what also happened was that um, when the scientists were discovering this Rosetto effect or how the community helped people avoid cardiovascular disease and help them live longer, what they also predicted was that if the people in Rosetta were to change their ways and go more mainstream American, uh, this effect will disappear. And unfortunately, this is exactly what happens uh in the next generation, so more or less starting in the late 70s and in the 80s, uh, the next generation of Rosettans, they started following the American dream. So moving to the suburbs, buying bigger houses, driving instead of walking, working longer hours, so having no more time for spending time with their neighbors and having backyard parties. Uh, and the health effects disappeared. They start. They just turned to be your average American. They, you know, they started having heart attacks and cardiovascular disease, and you know, living as long as anybody else in the surrounding towns of Pennsylvania. And um, it's kind of a sad story when you think about it. That you know, this little island of longevity just disappeared. Do you see any uh, towns or anything that's happening currently today or social experiments where people are trying to do that in a way that you find interesting? I mean, there's lots of things happening like that. You know, I write in Growing Young about the uh, concept of placemaking, and it happens mostly in big cities, so, you know, like Philadelphia, New York, and places like that, when people are, or Paris, where people uh, invent ways to change their community uh, into more Rosetto-style place. So it can be, for example, having uh, some community gardens, which usually work really, really well for things like that. So you not only grow your food together, but you also come together with your neighbors as a place to chat, to meet, organizing, you know, events or making sure the streets are more pedestrianized so that people can walk. You know, there is one study I also described in my book where uh, they calculated that the more traffic passes through a street, the less people know the neighbors. So basically, the calmer the le- your street, the more likely you're actually to know your neighbors. So pedestrianizing areas, making, you know, putting things like benches even so that people can sit down and meet their neighbors or having small, you know, growing, uh, planting trees to for like some small little parks, community parks where people can meet. So changing the, the communities in which we live to be more uh, accessible, also accessible for walk, for walking, because walking is how social relationships happen. If you're in your car, it's really hard to meet anybody. Um, so there is there is a lot of new movements like this in, in the cities as well, uh, mostly in the cities actually, uh, to change the way we li- live so we have more chances of uh, meeting our neighbors and having these kind of relationships. Listeners of this podcast have heard a, a few episodes where we've talked about the vagus nerve and the connection between the gut and the brain and this bi-directional superhighway. From the context of your book on longevity, tell us what you wanted your readers to understand about the vagus nerve and how central it is to connection and longevity. Yes. So vagus nerve is actually one of those things that connects and the way we live socially, or you could say mentally, uh, with how our bodies function and why, you know, having social connections or being kind or being optimistic actually makes us healthier and live longer. So the vagus is obviously the longest nerve that emerges from, from the brain and it's responsible for our breathing, for swallowing, digestion, things like that. And um and uh, it also, you know, connects our gut and our brain as well. So it, is, it takes part in our relaxation response. So the vagus nerve is something that helps you calm down after stress. So when you think, you know, about the experience of the savanna where our ancestors would stumble upon the lion and, you know, there is all the fight or flight response will turn on and they will get discussed from, you know, the cascade of hormones, uh, like cortisol, uh, for example, and turn on the response to prepare them to either fight or flight, you know, the, the uh, dilation, dilation of their pupils, you know, uh, emptying of bowels as well, things like that, to prepare for the fight. Then the vagus nerve is part of the response of coming after the danger passes. And uh, if it functions well, it's very important that it functions well. So 
that we can calm down after stress so it's not doesn't become chronic and chronically activated because this is when uh, bad things happen for our health. Uh, and um, what's also interesting about the vagus nerve that uh, it has been implicated uh, as a potential explanation of uh, a fascinating effect and phenomenon that happens in um, some tribes of the Pacific or in Africa of something called the voodoo death. And this is the most extreme when you can think about how our thoughts are connected to our health because the voodoo death is basically when somebody believes they've been cursed and they believe it so much that they actually die. So this is the extreme of mind-body connection. And uh, scientists now are thinking that it may be caused by the extreme activation of the vagus nerve. So basically, it shuts down uh, and causes the death. So it is a very important connection between our our minds and our our health. I wonder how uh, also, you know, the, the idea of just any media input, anything that you see out there that makes you believe. I think a lot of people, even though largely the data shows that the world is a safer uh, a place than it was. And it's one of the safest times in, in history. There's less, less extreme, uh, hunger, people dying of that. There's, there's, uh, less, uh, acts of violence that are in the world. But I think there's a lot of perception, uh, from just media inputs, overstimulation, which also includes social media that the world, a lot of people feel like it's going to shit, <laughs> whether it's actually going to shit or not is a different sort of question. But I wonder if that also plays into it in these stimulus that we're reading all the time. Um, I'd love to take, get your perspective on that. You know, have you found anything about news and, and consumption of it and how that changes our perception? You know, you're a journalist in, in your background and you're a writer. H have you come across anything about how inputs impact our view of things uh, when it comes to, um, our, our happiness, joy, and longevity. I mean, certainly I know in my own perspective, like example, that, you know, not, not reading news makes me much happier. I decided at some point during the pandemic that I was reading just far too much uh, and getting stressed about it. And uh, so I actually put, put some apps that block uh, news slides uh, on my phone and on my computer after you either I spent like half an hour on them or after certain hours in the evening and I actually feel much much better after doing that so that's obviously a study of one but in general you know research shows that uh, reading uh, about, about disturbing things makes us feel bad you know in, in the research actually scientists when they want to study uh, impact of moods or our feelings on our bodies, what they actually do to induce those bad moods, they will let people either s look at photos of disturbing like disturbing photos such as plane crashes or car accidents, or they will show them some kind of disturbing video. So we know that this is a very good way to induce a very a bad mood or anxiety or something that will, some kind of... Uh, uh, negative feelings because this is how psychologists do it in research so you know if you are watching constantly news and you see those plane crashes and car crashes and and hospitals full of patients and so on and so on you are inducing yourself into this kind of negative mood and it does have very concrete effects on the functioning of our bodies and on our health, including your, your antiviral response, how your body responds to viruses and on your immune system. So if you want to you know, make yourself, your immune system better, then you really should stop inducing that bad mood and watching the negative news. Yeah, it's, it's so addictive because obviously, as we all know, and you know well, because you were in that industry, is like, but you were with some great publications, but in general, we know that if it bleeds, it leads. And yeah, there's, uh, I was just about to say that. <laughs> there's yeah. a, uh, I've shared this quote before in past podcasts, but there's a, a Reverend Michael Beckwith who's based in Los Angeles at the Agape uh, Spiritual Center. He's an advisor to Oprah and many other people like that. And he says, you know, the, the news often, it's unfortunate. Yes, we have to be educated. We have to know what's going on in the world. But in, unfortunately, the news often is the lowest common denominator of humanity. Let's see everything that's kind of wrong in the world. Let's put it together. It's an entrenched system. It's tough. But I think on a personal level, and your book is filled with takeaways, not that you talk about this particular one, but I think the takeaway is exactly what you were saying earlier. We can put limits and blockers around us so that we don't over consume something and let the news hijack our brain. 
And you know, there's also another thing about media, and this also connects to the question, why you know, haven't we really heard about all these things about how our social lives or how our personality and our mental habits connect to our longevity and our health? And the reason for that is also unfortunately down to the media because when you think about it what sells are stories uh stories that are kind of attention catching right so for example things like even with diet right you don't if you want to sell an article as a journalist I will not really be able to sell an article saying eat more vegetables, it's good for you. <laughs> Nobody will publish that. Nobody wants to hear it again. It's the same old story. But unfortunately, from science perspective, this is this is what's the most correct. But science sometimes is boring. It just repeats the same stuff over and over. Eat more vegetables, exercise, you know, it's boring. So what makes headlines are things that are counterintuitive. So one time I saw a study that actually has found that eating sugar was good for you. It was a really badly done study. But of course it made headlines. It was all over the place because, you know, it's catchy, right? Eat more sugar, you'll be healthier. Uh, <laughs> of course the study was completely wrong, but <laughs> it didn't matter. And then people get confused and they're like, okay, one time they tell us this, one time they tell us that. And it's not the fault of science, really. It's mostly the fault of us journalists reporting on every tiny little thing that's surprising. And, uh, you know, unfortunately the the main trends are sometimes boring and just you have to repeat the same thing over and over and if the if they're even correct in the first place there's been a few uh um, uh, analysis meta-analysis of journalistic articles that have been published and some have found that even up to 40 percent is not actually what the study showed inside of there and then there's the follow-up aspect was was this the first version of the study did that later be disproved so it's entrenched it's the it's the public wants to buy it and the journalist wants to sell it so i think the responsibility is on all of us and i think that responsibility is be more aware, understand that sensationalism sells, and come back to the roots of things that are time-tested and proven in um, some of the societies that are out there. And, and a lot of that is featured inside of your book. But as you mentioned, it's not always sexy, so we have to figure out how we can make it sexy by talking about the new and interesting ways that maybe everybody hasn't uh, had a chance to heard about, hear about. So there's one section in your book where you do that. And I'm just going to give the title and I'd love you to give a little bit of an overview of why you decided to write about that inside the book. So you have a whole section in the book about uh, chameleons, right? Chameleons live longer, right? So for those people that are not familiar with what a chameleon is, explain that and then tell us why chameleons (laughs) live longer. Yes, so I don't mean that literally as the animal, but as people who mimic others. And uh, there is really some fascinating research showing that actually mimicking other people, they literally, you know, the the way the kids do, like trying to mimic somebody's movements, uh, activates certain processes in our bodies uh, that boost the health effects of being with other people. So, for example, also things like synchrony, so doing things in sync with others, like marching bands or uh, or sports that are in sync, like you know, rowing, for instance, or singing in a choir or dancing uh, in a flash mob. Uh, when we do things in synchrony, uh, the release of so-called social hormones, such as endorphins, for instance, can be double that of what we get if we just hang with other people without the synchrony. So, for example, if you dance uh, just you know, regular style, everybody doing their own thing with other people, uh, this will give you, of course, the social, the boost of the social hormones with all their positive health effects uh, and the feelings of connection and, and trust and so on. But if you do the dancing, let's say, I don't know, Macarena or something like that style uh, or line dancing, this will actually give you the double effect. So uh, there are some powerful things happening uh, in our bodies when we synchronize with other people. Uh, scientists are just beginning to un- uncover why that happens. And uh, of course, some of them point to mirror neurons 
in our brains. Uh, other is to some other effects like electric uh, synchronization of our brain waves as well. Lots of things happening in our brains that uh, could explain why synchrony has such powerful effects on our body. Uh, and you know, it also explains why all over the planet people love doing things in synchrony, be it pray, praying or uh, all these kind of dances that in so many different parts of the world are done in synchrony. That's precisely because it gives us this extra boost of feeling bonded with other people, but also that is good for our health. Yeah, just a reminder that when we, you know, the power of friendship, but also too, so many people try to enter into health alone. And it's very individualistic, like I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And how even the power of, you know, starting a little book club with just a small group of friends and taking on a small habit together, uh, doing kindness together in a group, those things become even more impactful when we do them with other people. I want to talk a little bit about the sense of purpose and belonging. Where does purpose come into play when it comes to longevity? I mean, so purpose and meaning are also things that have been shown in many, many different studies to uh, impact our longevity and uh, lower our mortality risk. Uh, you know, for example, there is research showing that uh, people who have meaning in their life, uh, they have lower lower levels of cortisol, so the stress hormones in their bodies, and lower levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines, so this little proteins that uh, in general when they the re, their levels are elevated for a long time in our bodies it can le- lead to things like for example diabetes so um so definitely looking for purpose and meaning uh, is very very important and, and can be good for your health and also for the mental well-being in general uh, because uh, there is so much research showing that when people uh when people find purpose they can withstand a lot of uh difficulties in their life. There was even one study I've read recently on coronavirus pandemic and having purpose, which showed that people who had purpose in life uh, withstood the stress of the pandemic much better than people who didn't have purpose in life. Tell us about this Japanese word, ikigai. Some of our listeners might have heard it before and some might be new to the term. What is this word and why is this philosophy so central inside of the Japanese culture? Yes, so the ikigai, this is also related to purpose in life. Uh, it translates something like reason for being, and it's supposedly not exactly the same thing as purpose in life, but it's extremely closely related. Uh, I think from our purpose, it can be used interchangeably. Um, so when I traveled to Japan, uh, when I was researching growing young, I uh, When I was meeting the scientists today, uh, one of the very first things that would come up in the conversation was exactly ikigai, whereas in the West, you know, the conversation usually uh, surround topics like diet and exercise, things like that, whereas in Japan, ikigai always came up very, very fast in conversations. And um, there is lots of research showing that ikigai, so having this reason for leaving, actually does translate into much lower mortality risk uh, in Japan. And uh, even the prefecture that is right now the place where the longest lived uh, part of Japan, which is Nagano, is no longer Okinawa, uh, their people have particularly high levels of ikigai and the Ministry of Health of Japan uh, has written some reports saying that this may be among the reasons why they live there so long. Uh, And they even included the the concept of ikigai or search for ikigai into the official health promoting strategy of, of Japan. So you can really see how important that is. And people often ask me, you know, what if I don't have some grand ideas for life or, you know, okay, some people may be trying to save the polar bears or uh, do things like some kind of really huge things, but I I don't really have anything like that. And uh, that's a common misconception because actually when I talked about Ikigai uh, with uh, octogenarians or septuagenarians in Japan, they actually told me that for them it's usually 
about something small, but always giving back to community. So it can be, for instance, taking care of your front yard so it looks nice for your neighbors. It can be taking care of your grandchildren uh, or participating in, I don't know, running the local library or just volunteering at the local library. It can really be something small that gives you the sense of ikigai. It doesn't have to be huge. Of course, it can be huge, but it doesn't have to be. Take it to, on a personal level. When you think about your life and what purpose means to you, what, what comes to mind? I mean, I, I am trying to do my best to, you know, to, pre- to prevent the climate change running amok as much, as much as I can with my writing. And, um, but uh, so maybe it's more of the kind of bigger ones, at least I'm trying to, but I'm doing my small part. So maybe, you know, the topic is huge, but my part in it is very small, but I still try to do my best. And this is something I even posted on my, I have a printout on my wall in my office, uh, you know, with this purpose. And just to remind me sometimes when I have a harder day at work and, you know, I'm struggling to write or struggling to concentrate, I look at it and to remind myself that I'm trying to do my little part in making the world slightly better. Well, Barta, I've been enjoying the book and uh, enjoying listening to you show up on a lot of other uh, podcasts. I've gotten a clip of a few different ones of them. I want to give you an opportunity to conclude with our audience here with uh, some some bigger picture messages, you know, toward towards the end of the book. Uh, you quote Michael Pollan's famous sort of uh, eat food, not too much, mm-hmm. mostly plants. And you had your own version of that that you wanted to include. So I'd, I'd love if you could share that and just give us the you know, final closing thoughts for the interview. Yes. Yeah, so my own take on that was, uh, of course, you know, still eat food and it's mostly plants, not too much. But he's definitely certain about it, correct about it. You know, diet and exercise are still very important. Uh, but if I were to add something, I would say be social, care for others, enjoy life. Well, the book is available for everyone to purchase, Growing Young, How Friendship, Optimism, and Kindness Can Help You Live to 100. We have a link for the Amazon in our uh, uh, show notes, as well as the growingyoungthebook.com. Uh, Marta, where else can people find you and keep in touch with you? They can find me on Twitter and Instagram uh, at mzaraska, so Z-A-R-A-S-K-A. And uh, don't, uh, don't hesitate to get in touch. I tend to reply to all the emails and messages from readers. Fantastic. Well, we'll have a link for those there as well. I wish you friendship, optimism, and kindness. And thank you for reminding us how powerful those things are in our life. Marta, so appreciate you being on the Broken Brain Podcast. <laughs>